this brings me to the opening of the first panel, and I would like to come to the uh, front of the room, the well-known people from all over the world, Ron Bisio, Vice President, Geospatial Trimble from the USA. Welcome, Ron, and take a seat. Dean Angelidis, Corporate Director, International Alliances, ESRI, USA. François Lombard, Head of Intelligence, Airbus, France. Prashant Schutle, Director General, Natural Resources, Canada. Uh, and Peter Rabley, Venture Partner for Mitchell Network, USA. Tan Boon Kai, the Chief Executive from the Singapore. Greg Scott, United Nations, you are already there. Thank you. This session, as was stated, and you can imagine, will focus on value. So what is the impact? What is the impact you are achieving? What is the impact you have been noticing in your personal career, your professional career? I think we are here together uh, talking about working on a life-changing technology. Geospatial technology pops up everywhere. Geospatial technology has been successful in areas we could not dream about maybe 10 years ago. And there is an enormous potential in it. The report Sanjay summarized shows this. So it's, it's really something which comes into our lives. You have also been citizens in the last period of time. You're users, but you're also responsible for creating value. Tan, from your perspective, can you give your opening statement of what is the value you have seen creating in your environment. Thank you. Can you hear me? Uh, thank you. Thank you, Rob. Um, and uh, thank you, Sanjay, and uh, my fellow panelists. Um, Singapore is delighted to be here today, um, largely because I realized that uh, perhaps I'm one of the uh, few players uh, from the government side that sits on a predominantly uh, wide business panel. Um, our interest in Singapore, and I believe for many governments worldwide, is to see how governments can act both as a facilitator as well as an enabler of geospatial technologies and data and work together with business partners, you know, like those on the panel, Esri, Trimble, Bentley and so on, to see how we can bring this technology forward. So perhaps give me, uh, let me give you a perspective of how we feel that the role of government will change um, in trying to proliferate geospatial technologies. Um, first and foremost, right from the beginning, um, in Singapore, we believe that government should play a critical role in defining standards, working with the open community to provide as much free data as possible in an increasing uncertain environment where cybersecurity and security risks are prevalent. I think it is the government's responsibility to provide a safe, stable and secure environment for businesses to function. Um, the second thing that I want to point out is something that we've been trying to do trying to grapple with in Singapore. Uh, in Singapore, we started what we call the Smart Nation Agenda or the Smart Nation Initiative. Uh, many of you uh, who have been to Singapore know it's a small country. We believe, however, that with geospatial technologies coupled with real-time sensor technology, the aim that we hope to achieve is to allow each and every citizen on the ground to be able to make informed decision using technology or using spatially enabled technology to make their lives better. So for example, um, we have tried to push as much of these open data, especially those on maps, to the communities so that they are uh, able to, for example, map not only the shortest way, but wheelchair, handicap-friendly ways, sheltered ways around 
also to be able to derive maximum value from many of the public services like transport, healthcare, to be able to make informed decisions. This, I think, is something that certainly governments can work more with the private sector. The government does not profess to have a monopoly of technologies or data, and we believe that through this, uh, the lives of each and every one of us will be much better. The last point I probably should make is, is this. Um, the government should take the lead in working with the private sector on a holistic master plan of how to develop geo -capa uh, geospatial capabilities, not only in terms of technologies, but in terms of manpower development. And I think in this case, uh, many of you have done it, working with educational institutions, universities, and so on, to see how we can level up the next generation so that we can bring this technology forward in a much better way. Government side. Let's go to one of the partners on the panel from the private sector. Ron, would you give you give us your sure. remarks? Sure. So uh, I think I, I'm speaking to a, a friendly audience here. We, we um we we are we are geospatial professionals in this room. We we understand the value uh, of geospatial data. We understand the impact it can have on decision making. Uh, one of the things that really excites me. Um, being in the geospatial industry is when a new audience discovers the value of geospatial data and um, the impact it can have on decision making. So I, I started to think about, well, I wanted to give an example of this as I, uh, Rob, is a, Rob is, a, is, a, is a tough taskmaster here. He's taken away our PowerPoint. So we're, we're up here bare to the world without PowerPoint. So I decided I was gonna use an example that I was gonna take us through. And I decided to talk about a simple building. And I'm going to just t stay with me as I walk through this, as we talk about a building. The other thing that Rob said is we could go back 20 years in our, in our past to think about this. I'm embarrassed to say that I have to go back 30 years. Um, I started in a university studying GIS in 1988. And um, I can remember digitizing buildings from, uh, from an aerial photograph. And you know, when, when you would get a, a building, you'd know nothing but the, the footprint of it, where it was, maybe its size. Now, who valued that geospatial data? Well, at the time, the economic development planner would go into the, the GIS lab, and they might be looking for all of the buildings within a certain distance of public transportation that are of a certain size that they could then go out and, and offer to a company that wanted to move to that city. So there was a, a relatively small group of people, professionals, who might find value in that spatial data. In, uh, in 1993, I started working at Esri, and uh, that was at the time when GIS was, was moving out of, the, uh, out of the lab. You know, there was tools and, and like ArcView, for example, that was taking data from the lab and giving it to a whole new group of people. The other thing that was interesting about GIS at that time was we also ha had the ability to look at that, that building as it changed over time. So now you've got a building that um, you're watching it change over the years. Now who's that data interesting to? Who sees value in that data? So now you've got tax authorities that want to understand, you know, how can I, what's the new value of that building? You might have public safety officials who are looking at that building as it's growing in height to make certain that it's not, um, it's not growing beyond where the fire apparatus can get to. So again, you have a whole new audience that's now outside the GIS lab who sees value in that data for its uh, impact on, on decision making. And then finally, at, at Trimble, I've been exposed to a whole new group of technology, uh, scanning, indoor mapping, uh, building information modeling, BIM. So we've now gone from knowing where the building is, how it's changed over time. Now we're not only inside the building, we're inside the room, and we're inside the wall. We're actually now looking at, at spatial data about features and structures inside, inside walls. The very first time that I put on a mixed reality headset, um, HoloLens, and I took a look at a design, and I was looking at proposing a window to go right there and seeing how it was going to clash with the beams behind it. 
or the infrastructure behind that wall, I realized at that point there was a whole new audience that was going to find value in this geospatial data. Architects, engineers, tradespeople, police, fire, all these people that interact with this building were now going to find value in this data and it was going to help them in their decision making. So every time technologies evolve, a new group of people are finding value in the data and it's helping them impact, uh, helping them with their decision making. Okay, thank you. Let's move on to the developing organization, to the United Nations. Greg, where would you be without geospatial? Thank you. Um, so, I guess taking, coming from the United Nations, I need to take a perspective of, I suppose, the ultimate parliament of 193 member states and, and thinking about development. And our thoughts as we work through this in the, in the UNGGIM process is that, and, and Sanjay articulated this very well, is that, is that innovation and technology and just what's happening in that, that global process, the way that the development's taking place with the different types of technologies and capabilities, they are their own ecosystem in themselves. They're going to do their own thing. They will do what they will do based on the demands and the requirements as that evolves over time. And to, an e to a degree, we don't have a lot of control in that. At the same time, we also have an industry that is also going gangbusters. And we've saw, we saw that also around, around the, the latest analysis from 2018. We have a very, a very strong, a very vibrant, and a very willing industry that's wanting to do more. Um, and that includes also working with governments um, and, and some of the challenges that we see with the agility and the capability of industry combined and attached to the innovation and technology that's also taking place is meaning that governments need to rethink and transform and, re and, and rebadge what they've traditionally done into what they may need to do into the future. And so for them, a lot of it's about, well, how do we go about doing that? And so they, they are less agile, but they are very, very motivated. And the reason that they're sort of motivated is there are policies now that are pushing countries and governments, and I'll use the SDGs and all of the development agendas around climate and disasters and the Samoa pathway, is around how governments need to measure and monitor. And the role of industry, the role of innovation, technology, all those capabilities, and the role of governments and how they, they deliver all of that ubiquitous information, technology and development into the processes is vitally important. And I think that's the key thing if we talk about, well, what's a new audience? Um, we, we are a professional community here. But if we to flip this coin around a bit and we talk about development, and this year we're 20% into the 2030 agenda. Next year we're quarter of the way through. And we have requirements that by 2020 we reach the least developed countries first with data, including geospatial data. And I would suggest we're not there yet. Okay. But we have this ecosystem that can do it. And the challenge for us at the moment is how we bridge that. How do we get around bringing some of those huge and enormous capabilities and capacities into that process, into those that aren't even on that aspirational path at the moment. Okay. So those are some opening thoughts. Thank you. Yeah. Let's bring it to, P to you, Peter. Peter Rapley, you have a background in the geospatial community, but you're now bringing investors to the, to the industry. From a, from a venture capitalist view, what, what have you seen as the growing value of geospatial technology? First of all, I should say that I'm unabashed geographer from a long time ago and it's it's uh, never left me the last five years I've been at a media network we are what's called an impact investor so we try and use investments or grants for social positive social change um, I think what surprises me is that old statement the more things change the less they do and I'm reminded of that in in every every day that I sort of go to work so let me give you some numbers to illustrate what I mean we know approximately four billion of the world's population are informal. It means they don't really exist in any formal sense like we do. We don't have records. 
Um, that is changing, certainly here with Aadhaar, which is one of the greatest public uh, sector uh, innovations and, and digitalization. But for much of the world, that still doesn't exist. And I like to think of it as a who, what, where. Everything we do, we don't look to invest. Who are you? What are you doing? What are your rights? And where are you? And so for a huge proportion of the world's population, we simply don't have that information. We don't have that data. And as a result, we have increased urbanization. We have impacts on climate change. We have environmental problems and concerns. We can't even begin to plan. We know that 90% of sub-Saharan Africa is not mapped in any up-to-date fashion. We know that 60% of the world's housing, according to the World Bank, is self-built. And it's probably going to increase to 80% by 2030, 2040. And so the role of geospatial data is critical as we think about how we invest for social impact and social change. We need data. We need good, reliable, up-to-date data. Not one-off project data, but we need good, fundamental data. And that where of the who, what, where that I mentioned is really, really important. And I think uh, what we can do as an industry is we can look at that as a market opportunity, certainly, probably needing to work with government in partnership to address that huge, sizable market that will have to come into formality to join the two billion that are in the formal economy. Because if they don't, there's conflict, and we see it every day. Um, so I think geospatial, for me, is critical in how we think about our investments and how we think about who we're trying okay. to help. Okay. Thank you. Great story. Thank you. Reminds me to this uh, really nice statement from the UN that everything is, some, is happening somewhere. So the, the, the role of location is so important. That brings me to you, Francois. Francois Lombard from Airbus, you are on the data side. What is your view of the value, the growing value? Thank you, Rob. Well, first of all, I'm, I'm lucky enough indeed to uh, lead the geospatial business of Airbus since. Uh, since some time, and uh, I know Sanjay said uh, we should not speak about the past, but I have to praise uh, some, some of my predecessors. Because 30 years ago, basically, uh, one person in France decided we need to launch an Earth observation satellite. It was spot one at that point of time. It started with a very small team, a startup, and uh, very little money, actually. And, uh, and it worked. And now, 30 years later, I'm here with uh, about 2,000 people working days and nights, to be frank, with uh, all this Earth observation data we try to deliver to the geospatial industry. Uh, Ten years ago, the Airbus Group decided it's really a nice uh, investment to make in this business. And I think they had a good business sense because it's one of the fastest growing segments in the Airbus Group today. So I, I cannot speak for the overall economy, but I can tell you, at least for this small company, it's really a, a very exciting, uh, exciting business. Uh, one, one of the facts as well uh, I find amazing is that almost every week I have new part of the economy coming to us and asking for more data, better data, uh, and better uh, tools to do decision making. Uh, just to mention a very old industry, the car industry, which obviously is using the GPS since a long time, is now really opening up to, um, to all the data you can get from, uh, from Earth observation, uh, because obviously they are surfing also on the autonomous car trend, and uh, they need very precise ground control points if you want to drive autonomously these vehicles. And uh, it's amazing that they are opening up to us. Obviously, the big giants of the digital world, the Google, the Apple, the Microsoft, and so on, uh, have also opened up about five, ten years ago, and, and they are really now some of our biggest uh, customers. And I'm very thankful to them because they are open to the world of the normal human being to have access to geospatial data. Um, finally, maybe something which uh, I found very interesting over the last, uh, the last month, the agro-industry. Uh, which has been always very interested in our information to improve, optimize the way they do agriculture, now is interested on the in environmental impact of, uh, of what they do, 
uh, forest impact, all the things uh, which they need to prove to their customers that they are doing it right, and they need some information which is good, which is persistent, which is uh, coherent to actually prove it. So this trend is, uh, is, is, doing, uh, is doing well for us. However, I think we all recognize there are a few challenges, and uh, especially what was mentioned this morning, is the democratization of the data. But not of any data, of very high quality data, coherent data is something we need to push, and we need to make it available for more people. Um, I think as well we have, to, we have to think more and more in 3D. Uh, there's, uh, I mean, all this satellite imagery obviously is very beautiful in 2D, but it has a little sense if you think long term about, uh, I don't know, autonomous flying vehicles in cities, uh, the 2D data has a limited value. So we, we really need to get into this 3D mode, and, uh, and we are doing this together with the rest of the industry, I think. The last point, and that's where, Greg, I'd like to, to tell you, I think we are taking the, the right move. Uh, towards 2030 and even 2020, which you mentioned, uh, which is about investing into the right sensors, into the right uh, infrastructure to actually give you persistence, give you the right data, uh, which we make available, um, the geospatial services, which, uh, which we will wish for. Uh, and just to mention the Airbus Group, but I know the rest of the industry is making this move. Uh, I think there has never been as much investment as currently, uh, obviously in space. Uh, and, uh, but not only in space, all the drone industry is waking up since a few years and uh, is investing now close to billions into uh, uh, what you will get in 2020, I hope, I cross fingers, we are working hard on this. Uh, you will get persistent information over cities, uh, you will get uh, video, you will get very, very precise high resolution data and I, I cannot imagine how many things we can do with that. Thank brings you me to well. you, uh, Prashant, also representing a government, the government of Canada, Canada, a country with a, with a rich history in using geospatial technology. What is, what is the thing you, surprised, you, you were surprised by creating value in Canada? Um, and thank you for, uh, for the invitation, Sanjay, and thank you for the, for the questions. I won't repeat what my colleagues have said, because I think there are some very trenchant insights but I would divide what I would consider the impacts as known impacts and unknown impacts. And I think those are extremely important to differentiate and to work on as a global community. I would say that the known impacts of geospatial in Canada cut across four broad areas. One, an economic domain, where we know things like the impact of geospatial technology and data <coughs> contributes 1% of Canada's GDP, which is a massive number, um, to the tune of $21 billion annually. We know that at the micro level of certain types of firms that the productivity improvements to oil and gas is about 7%, the productivity improvements to agriculture 4%, uh, to forestry 5%. Again, those are massive numbers and we actually had to rub sleep from our eyes thinking that that, these, that there was something wrong with our economic model and we went back and we tested it and tested it and tested it and came back that yeah. these numbers were actually, we tampened down all of the values and we actually now think that the numbers are low. So there's, there's a very significant, very significant capability here that we have. There's social, uh, there's a social domain and how is it that geospatial can affect social uh, impacts in Canada? Currently, we're using geospatial capabilities through our federal geospatial platform to actually bring together various levels of government at high levels of decision making to model uh, economic and social investments at the federal level. So the clerk of our Privy Council worked with the clerk of a number of, and that's our highest level bureaucrats, the clerk of the Privy Council, um, worked with the clerks of the provinces to determine certain types of investments in certain areas. And the, that was the first time that active and real-time geospatial capability was used to model certain investments, to look at communities, then to model <coughs> baselines of education, of healthcare, so on and so forth in those kinds of communities. That also has a uh, a, 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 an immediate impact on how you look at environmental issues as well. Because it's basically, if, you're, if you build once and use many times, 
the economic modeling capability, the GIS and Earth observation capabilities of Ford can also be used in social and environmental cases. And then there's this richness of analysis that comes about. And to, to my view, it also has an effect on the fourth broad thematic, which is health and security. And by security, I mean human security as well. I guess one of the areas that I think is also known is that we know that there's duplication that's now occurring as more and more people enter into the geospatial uh, world. We know that some government programs are funding activities that that are seen as digital platforms, but are essentially recreation of what it is the geospatial community has done in terms of digital elevation models, or types of analytical platforms that exist. Um, I would say that one of the known impacts that I've seen is, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, and I would invite people from the audience to, to throw this back at me, is that we are stronger as a community internationally than we are domestically in our own jurisdictions. And oftentimes when government agencies and the private sector go forward to lobby and articulate within domestic environments, it is far harder to make the case domestically than we in this international collaborative can make. Especially when I think of the context of the work that we're doing at the UN on sustainable development goals and or things like fundamental data themes, investments in open data, and in creating the value chains that are essential for things like Earth observation. I see Barb Ryan there and I know that Barb has seen things on both sides of the fence. Um, and finally, for me, the final impact is what I see as a known impact is despite the, despite the flirt around open data and open government, I'm worried that the open movement is being somehow left behind. And that's critical for us to address in terms of digital divide. Because if we are insistent on ensuring a level of democratization of humanity where all people are considered and treated equally uh, and all people have access to basic human rights, then we need to ensure that we don't create some level of a dystopian future where everything is simply a subscription for service, where we're left beholden to those who can only afford to pay to play, get to play. And to my mind, these are some of the impacts that are known and are emerging. And what's unknown is how it is many of the other areas of commercial as well as governmental interest. And, I, and I'm very, very insistent on that, is that we do have other government departments that are entering into the world that we live in and we breathe and where we see them going in areas of opportunity and activity that is similar to what we do or almost exactly the same as what we do, that to me, that unknown impact is, is a grave threat to the 30 or 40, year, 40 years of, of effort that has gone on in, in this global community where we've all taken efforts and great pains to build once, use many times, and create economic value, social value, environmental value, health and security value for the greatest number, um, uh, the greatest number f uh, of all. Okay. Thank you. We will take your point later for a discussion. But I would like to go to finally to to Dean Angelis from from ESRI, from ESRI. Sorry, what is your what is the thing which has changed most your life as a professional with geospatial? Yeah, this is a, this is a difficult thing for me. Uh, I began using, it wasn't even called GIS then. Yeah. Uh, the, term, the term that uh, Roger Tomlinson sort of helped to create uh, Roger was actually still inventing, in a sense, what was going on. But 
in my career, uh, the reason I began using GIS was because uh, I wasn't very good at climbing trees. Uh, I was a forester, uh, that's my education, and the organization I worked for had no maps uh, that actually defined the forest resources and the land resources. Uh, so there was uh, a lot of reports and green bar paper and things like that, but we didn't know where those resources really were and how they were distributed. So uh, I used to have to climb to the ridge and look across or uh, climb a tree in places to, to try to get that view uh, that actually Francois talks about now that's very commonplace. Uh, so uh, we actually built an information system for managing the forest resources and GIS was actually at the foundation of that. And that was, uh, well, 40 years ago. It was sort of early days. So looking at what was going on there, now we used to kind of dream about the technology that was there. It's like, well, I don't want to climb a tree. I want to send a little robot thing up there and it can get the view for me. Uh, and I don't actually want to measure with this tape and take this thing and hike all around. I want to have a little gun that I can just shoot at something and get the distance. So we've sort of evolved from all of the difficulties of just doing the work into having the technology that takes the measurements, absorbs the measurements, helps us manage all those measurements and sensed information so we can actually apply it. Uh, so I've really watched a trans complete transformation from, you know, into actually the foundational aspects of what will become this digital transformation that we can now embark on or as Sanjay is talking about, the fourth industrial revolution. Um, but what is, what is the impact actually of having all these uh, sets of information? We keep talking about content, but the real challenge that we still face is actually having people that have a problem that they need to solve and taking that information and knowing that they can actually apply it to do a better job of managing or deciding or uh, you know, helping people have a better life. So that still is like a huge gap that we have to close, frankly. Um, I think we, you know, we have the technology and it's really evolved. But what we still lack, actually, is the transmittal of knowledge to people that are actually trying to solve the world's problems. Uh, that, I think, is probably the, it's, it's you know, Ron, t you actually talked about sort of that aha moment that, that is one of the real satisfying things. Um, and at the same time, when people have that aha moment, I go, man, we are really failing as an industry because why does this person have to have an aha moment for something that's been around for 20 years, 10 years, 5 years, whatever? So it's sort of this reinvention of all of this knowledge that people continually go through. So uh, in this next few years of, of my career, uh, I've made it sort of my personal mission to try to help people understand what we already know. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the, the day that this happened was actually uh, about, well, it was uh, just a little over two years ago, and I was at this IBM trade show the world of Watson, cognitive computing. 
And here come all of these very energetic data scientists. And what they're on the hunt for is data. And we actually even talked about that here today. You know, what's, what data do you have? So they're like scrounging up all these data. Like, and then if, if they have more data, they can solve more problems. That's their idea. Uh, but what they were missing is sort of the fundamental framework um, in a way we're calling this now the science of where. Uh, but it's about gathering and sensing the right information. It's about managing it correctly. It's about analyzing, applying analytics to that information and modeling and making predictions. And then using that in the design context to actually create a situation for the future, being able to socialize all that, which is what Tan was talking about as part of the SLA mission, and then actually bringing all that to action and then measuring it again. What Greg was talking about, actually sort of this idea of geo-accounting. You know, we set off to do a set of of, of actions, are we accomplishing it? Are we accomplishing our mission? Do we need to adjust and how? So it's sort of this fundamental framework, actually, that underpins everything that we all do. Uh, so we need to teach this, <laughs> and we need to have people understand it, or we actually need to make it somehow ubiquitous and it just happens. Uh, so in a way, we need to sort of envelop everything that we do, in a sense, with the science of where. So it just happens. I mean, that's kind of the, the vision. Just like the same vision of, well, look, I'm lazy and I don't want to climb up the hill. I just soon send a robot up and have the robot do it. And it's a lot cheaper and easier uh, to do that than it is for me to do it. Okay, but it's, so it actually is about taking our knowledge and being able to make it more broadly available and broadly accessible so people can actually apply it to the real world problems. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, th thank you for your story and, and the passion uh, behind. Thank you. In a few minutes, so I would like you all, my colleagues, uh, to give you 15 seconds to to end your contribution. Maybe there's something you regret you said, then you can say it now. Or something you failed to say, now you can say it. So that's the end of the session. Then, is there anything you regretted about the, the dinner now? Eh? Well, I, I come away um, having the sense that more than ever we are convicted in what we want to do. So I probably will say this, let's stay convicted Let's stay together and let's do this together. Peter? Collaboration. I'm with Peter. Collaboration. I regretted to thank the organizers for bringing us together. These things are extremely important. Thank you. Kurt? Yeah. Education and awareness. Kurt? And doing it in a meaningful, storytelling way so it has impact. Also? Collaboration in innovation. I think we was a very nice graph at the beginning of uh, showing that we are more collaborating than we used to be. I think it's a very good trend. We should follow this. Continue. Yeah. Greg? The the one the one liner that that got the UN to understand geospatial was that governments cannot do it alone and nor can industry. We do it together. Okay. And this is a good example of that. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Mm -hmm.